So tonight's topic is uh, latent semantic analysis, but I'm also going to cover this basic idea of what is a vector space model. Okay? So building semantic vector spaces and how can we use them? So we'll start by using them for simple purposes like visualization, exploration, similarity. And then as we kind of gain that skill set at the end of the semester, I'll show you how to use them for um, predictive tasks. So they could be the data um, data features for a machine learning task. And then we'll get into like a, what is a distributional model as a whole. Okay, and then how do we build and play with this analysis space. Okay. So semantic vector space is a popular term for what we'll call distributional models. If you've ever heard the term bag of words model, that's what these are designed for. Okay. And the idea here is that we learn language from repeated experience, right? So if you're young, you're acquiring language because it's you know, unintentional. But as you grow older, you actually have to learn the language. So if you've tried to learn a second or eighth language, um, you can tell sometimes it's very difficult. Or better at it as kids, for sure. So either way, um, we learn from a repeated experience, exposure over and over again. Right? So. If that's true, which we know it is, uh, we can build these language models from a lot of text, a corpus, okay, that mimics that process, okay, or at least represents the idea of language as a whole. And so right now our, re our research team is working on this idea of like, what's the best type of model to build for various languages? So there is this sort of assumption um, in some of the published literature that all languages have the same underlying structure, which I think is a bit of a weird assumption, especially if one is comparing something like Arabic to English, they clearly have very different structures. So why should we model them in the same way? So um, we're actually building a lot of these models right now for about 50 or 60 languages. It's uh, slow going <laughs> is what it is. So this all kind of boils down to this idea published many moons ago now that you know a word by the company it keeps. And, and the popular use for these types of models is to understand word relatedness. So I'm trying to figure out like what's the most related words to dogs. So it's kind of like finding synonyms, although I think that's a very um, oversimplification of what these models do. But that's certainly something we can use them for, to find words that are dissimilar or words that are very similar because they keep the same company. They appear in the same texts and the same types of places, that kind of thing. Um, the same uh, discourse is the word I'm looking for here. And so we can say, well, these are very similar because they appear in similar types of places. And so latent semantic analysis, not first published by Landauer and DeMay, this kind of math had been around for a while, but made popular by Landauer and DeMay, is one of the most famous distributional models. Sometimes people call this latent semantic indexing. That is how it's known in the Jensen package. It's the same thing. And it's very popular. I remember one time a reviewer told us that no one had ever heard of this. And I was like, well, it has been cited like 25,000 times. So I think you're probably wrong. Um, it is definitely, it's not as favored as topic models for analytics folks, but it's definitely very popular in academia. And we'll compare these two to each other so you can see what the, the differences are. And we can use these models to predict things like semantic similarity, word categorization, like how do we know what how people are going to group words together comprehension exams and essay scoring um, lsa models were used to predict scores on the toefl the test of english fluency and so um they you know when you build one of these models they can be used in a predictive way but the biggest criticism of all types of distributional models is the the fact that they're a bag of words model and so the bag of words model gets its name from the fact that you take all of these individual words and you sort of shake them up and you count them up and you ignore context and word order. So you just have like a raw frequency count of each word in each document. That loses all context. So sarcasm or ambiguity or um, analogy, all gone. 
Now these models still work, so I, I, I am yet unconvinced. So I was telling someone the other day, I wasn't, um, I still think these models work pretty well because we can use them to predict. And I wasn't convinced that the more complex models, like a word to vec, were totally necessary. And we'll do word to vec and we'll talk about that. Um, kind of uh, push and pull of which one should we use. Some other kind of, that's like a big criticism on all levels. Some criticisms more in the sort of theoretical realm is that there isn't a good reason, like, you know, we can predict things, but sometimes the why, why does it predict is not super clear. And it doesn't really explain like this concept of like, well, we learn from repeated experience. So how does this model actually represent that in the brain? Um, whereas word to vec models are meant to do that. And an LSA model does not have built into it this idea of incremental learning, which is something we, as humans, clearly do. Uh, another famous distributional model is HAL. And um, I just would love to have been a fly on the wall when Kurt Burgess was making this up, because it's a 2001 Space Odyssey reference, right? So the hyperspace analog to language. And they're publishing this at the same time. So for a long time, these two models were very competitive of which one was better. And there's lots of research on like, well, is HAL better or LSA better? And I think they both work pretty well. They just are slightly different. And then topics models came along and they're very in, sort of intuitively appealing. And so a lot of people have switched to that. But HAL is a moving window hypothesis. So it's this idea that the model learns to, um, cite some of the criticisms of LSA by scanning the document, kind of pretending that there is a word window. And so it does do incremental learning. It's still a bag of words model though, so it doesn't represent context like we would want it to. And it does predict things. So you can use it to predict semantic test performance, problem solving, similarity, and priming. Now, similar newer models called COLS, which is the correlated occurrence and that analog to lexical semantics. I would tell you that people in corpus linguistics love a good acronym. <laughs> and so um, most of these have great acronyms. COLS, there um, is another one that we'll talk about here in a minute. That's a great acronym. So what's the comparison between the two? So LSA models, and the model itself doesn't argue, right? It's just computer code. But the people behind this argue that words are similar if they appear in the same context. And we can represent context by document and count them up. Whereas HAL says words appear if they're similar in the same position. So it does kind of hold on to that positional code. Not as well as a word to vec model. So we'll see later how word to vec captures context and position. So my favorite one is Beagle, okay, by Mike Jones at Indiana. And Beagle is a combination model, sometimes called a random vector model, that is supposed to represent both LSA and HAL type approaches. I say supposed to, it, it is meant to, it does represent this idea. And another model that's similar called the temporal context model. And they also kind of add in this flavor of just a little bit of noise. Because every human is slightly different. We all have different experiences and past learning events. And so it kind of tries to incorporate these different competing interests by using random vectors. Um, sometimes these are called attractor networks as well, because the idea is that things that are similar are attracted to each other in the uh, vector space model, right? So this multi-dimensional space that we're building. Pretty much everything we've done so far has been to D space. Right? Factor analysis is more, more D space if we use three, four, five factors. Um, but these models get very large. So almost everything, excuse me, we've done so far has been in smaller dimensional spaces. So like cluster analysis, you know, the idea is to get with smaller clusters, two, three, four, five. Um, with factor analysis, you're still trying to reduce dimensionality. Uh, what are the other ones? Random trees, right? So all of that is like trying to take a lot of noise and a lot of data and reduce it down 
distributional models of the other way around. It's trying to build a, the complex structure of, of the text. And you can have three, four, eight thousand dimensions if you want. So we, these are very complex usually. Now topics models, most people pick smaller dimensional spaces, but you don't have to. That's just a popular use of them. Um, so a topics model, good timing, assumes that the text has this like underlying set of topics or themes that we can just dis be discovered. Now, LSA can also use this idea of themes where the dimension, the way that we kind of keep track of the counts of the data, um, uh, represents the theme. Okay, so I'm going to try to use the word theme when I talk about dimension here um, to not confuse it with topics models because they call them topics, but the conceptual idea is the same. Okay. It's some sort of representation of what's going on in the text. So we'll look a little bit about pre-processing text documents. I'm going to show you, like, hopefully over the end of the semester, you'll know five different ways to do this. Um, we have not really covered this problem yet, but corpora, or the input of text documents, very messy. Um, lots of things to think about and consider. And so now we'll just look at it a little bit. In my other class, I do, like, two whole weeks on <laughs> pre-processing text. How do I calculate coherence of a text? This is very handy. So thinking about um, the representation of the text or of English, if you will, and how much do the sentences in a new document map together? Um, how do I create my own semantic space? And then what do I do with that semantic space? So exploring the neighborhoods. All right. So in an LSA, a really in a semantic space models or distribution models, the first thing you always create is some sort of term by document matrix. And depending on which software package we're using, it might be documents by terms. So you'll hear this described in a couple different ways as term by document or document by term matrix or a vocabulary by documents matrix. Like what essentially we're creating is a row with each concept as the row. So dog, cat, sneeze, coffee, water, like words, concepts. And each column is a document. Okay? Documents can mean lots of different things. They can be tweets, they can be paragraphs, they can be entire libraries of Congress. Like document is at whatever level you define it at. Inside the cells, not on this bullet point yet, but inside the cell is a raw count of the number of times that word or concept appeared in that document. And so you have words that are very frequent, like the, the, and, a, of, that appear in every document many times. So those words are not useful in understanding the semantics, the meaning, or the context, because those are function words. So we'll get rid of a lot of function words okay, when we process these documents. But once we have that matrix, a term by document matrix, and it's really just a complex conditional frequency table of how many times does a word appear in each document. For LSA, you're going to do a singular vector decomp or singular, sorry, value decomposition. I'm just excited about the word vector tonight. Singular value or SVD. And what that does is um, what we end up with, you can actually do this either way. So I have this as reduced rows, but you can actually do this both ways, where I can create the dimensionality of the data okay, and look at words by dimension, or I can create documents by dimensions. Okay. So if I'm trying to figure out how similar two words are, okay, I want words by dimensions. So how much do these words have the same dimensional structure? If I'm trying to figure out how similar two documents are, like a plagiarism de detector, um, I want to know how, how the, the documents by dimensions matrix. So it kind of depends on which um, focus in the analysis you want to go with. Um, in this way, I talked about reducing vocabulary but hanging on to documents, but I can go the other way too. And so I can measure similarity. This is one thing I use them for, is using it, looking at similarity between the terms or um, between, the, between the documents. So this is briefly kind of what that looks like. Two seconds. Can you eat out? Yeah. Oh. 
She'll be back in like two minutes. All right, so this is a visual representation of a term by document matrix okay, where we have our terms here and our five documents. So we would probably say that these two documents, two and three, go together because they have similar terms and they don't contain the other terms. So those are probably about traffics on networks. These first the documents one, four, and five are very similar because they have um, a similar pattern of those types of words. And so they're probably about um, algorithms and entropy. And that's very, that is the, the matrix, the raw matrix. But we don't tend to use the raw matrix. And I'll um, get into why here in a minute. When we build our own semantic space, we'll talk about why the raw matrix is not the best idea. Sometimes it's called a count vectorizer in Python. There's a code for that. And it has a lot of issues um, embedded in it because of the types of distributions that that creates. So raw frequency matrix can um, is definitely not normally distributed. So what we're going to use is our example data for this lecture in the next lecture is these exam answers. So many moons ago, I taught a undergraduate cognitive psychology course, and I would ask them essay exam questions, and then I quit <laughs> because they vary widely in their um, um, not goodness in their input. What's the word I'm looking for here? Attentiveness, um, like how hard they tried. Okay, so um, what people had to do was they had to look at and tell me what words meant. So we gave them about ten, six or eight different terms, and they had to string them together in a coherent paragraph to tell me what those terms meant. So obviously the first term in those two examples is attention. So this is the lectures on. Um, the differences in types of uh, cognitive attention and the experiments that we did to dis to explain attention to folks, what's called bottom-up and top-down processing, which is this idea that we have these involuntary systems that respond to certain cues in our environment. So if there's a really loud noise, suddenly you will turn your head and look because that's an evolutionarily good idea. And then there's controlled attention. You know, the thing that we try to do when we're in lecture <laughs> doesn't always work. Um, even though I lose my train of thought. Uh, and so, you know, I had a list of these terms that they had to explain to me, like, how do these things go together? And so the answers range from not very good, where they wrote one sentence and only described one of the terms, to one of the better answers where they wrote multiple sentences and described all the terms. So we have a wide range of types of documents, but the documents here are their answers to the, to the exam. Cool. And so one function that I really love is the ngram library. It has this function called preprocess. So I'm going to show you two different ways to do preprocessing in this lecture alone. One of them is this one. So preprocess does some very kind of basic stuff. And so it takes, I um, just want to show you the arguments here. So it takes in a single string. And then you can have you have the option to lowercase that string, which is generally a good idea, so that we can combine like terms no matter how they wrote it in the sentence. So pretty much the first step is always lowercase everything. Remove punctuation. Now for this example, I'm going to choose false, and you'll see why in a minute. Remove numbers. I'm also going to choose false because numbers are okay. And then fix spacing. So this takes out all the returns, all the times that they hit enter, tab double spaces, like it eats all the extra white space. My biggest problem with preprocess as a function is that it requires you do one string at a time. So because I've imported my exam answers as a data frame, I, and it's only got one column, I can cheat here and use the apply library and sort of hack the fact that this is one vector built into a data frame. If you have it truly as a vector in R, you won't, can't do this because apply requires it be a data frame, which annoys me about apply, but this is a data frame with one column. So I can tell it to apply that to each column. So data frame, one for rows, 
um, apply that to every row, there's only one column, and apply the preprocess function. And since I have a data frame already, I can save it as a new column. So I have my original answers and then a column called processed. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to see like how good are these answers? Like if I wanted to score their answers without ever reading them, because that's a beautiful lie, right? Grading goes much faster that way. What I can do is grab a pre-built semantic space and compare their answer to that semantic space. Cool. Because then I can say, how much does their answer map onto that space? So it does it match? Does it not match? And so semantic spaces, pre-built ones, and R are kind of words as rows and the dimensions or the themes as the columns. So this is a, a term by dimension matrix. And so the numbers here represent the kind of weight of that word to that dimension. Okay, obviously this is not a frequency anymore, especially because it's negative, but it's the weight of that term to the dimension. So all the numbers tend to be small, but look, rabbit here is very highly related or more strongly related to dimension three. And this keeps going. I just told it to only print a small portion for you. And so this particular one is in the LSA fund package. And we'll use one more from the LSA fund folks. And they built it using the LSA uh, library in R. And it's based on Alice in Wonderland. So it's literally as you can see, rabbit is one of the most, one of the um, big words here. It's literally a semantic space that is meant to represent what is Alice in Wonderland. Now I picked this example on purpose to show you why it matters what space you use. So just because I've built an LSA model, that does not mean that it's useful for everything. So we're going to calculate coherence. Coherence is the, um, practically mathematically, it's the cosine between two adjacent sentences. So you take sentence one and you find all of the words in that semantic space. You take sentence two, find all the words in that semantic space, and then you calculate the relationship or the overlap between them, and that value is a cosine. Cosine here ranges from zero to one, where zero is none, and one is perfectly the exact same words. They do go negative sometimes, but mostly in our case, use cases, it's zero to one. Okay, it's a distance measure, okay, an amount of overlap. And it's not the overlap totally between the sentences and the idea of like, they share all the same words. If they do share all the same words, it will literally be the same. But the idea is like, how much thematically do they match? The global coherent is the average cosine of all pairwise sentences. So one to two, two to three, three to four, etc. And so cosine here is just a measure of similarity. It's comparable to a correlation in that it can be negative, but that would be a little weird here. Um, sometimes they're very small negatives, like close to zero, just treat that as zero. And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about similarity measures for the whole lecture. So let's try it. Okay, so why did I hang on to punctuation? Many pre-processing functions in R for text get rid of punctuation, and we will. However, the purpose of coherence is to calculate the, the, the relationship onto the space between sentences. So you've got to know where those sentences are so you can't lose the punctuation. So the first thing this coherence function does is it finds the, it tokenizes by sentence, so it breaks it into sentences and then calculates. Unfortunately, coherence also runs one document at a time. So I just picked number five here as our example because it's a nice, good, long answer. And I told it that our semantic space was Alice in Wonderland. And look what happens. Even though the sentences in that document are about the same thing, they're not about the same thing when one compares it to Alice in Wonderland. So you get these NAs and this warning here because the words in those first four or five sentences are not in our semantic space. None of them. <laughs> so this is not a very good comparison point. And then, that, and then it says, well, everything else, so like I said, you can get negatives, 
Um, that means they're kind of like have completely opposite dimensions. It's in a sentence. Um, but generally, the average score, sorry, the average score is zero. Hi, me and this mouse. Let's throw it out the window. Okay, let me just try it on my computer here. Is zero. So you're telling me that this answer that I would have scored very highly has no coherence. None of the sentences match. No, what I'm saying is that none of the sentences appear to have the same themes when we compare this to Alice in Wonderland. And you're, thought, you're like, duh, because these are totally different topics. But I just want to highlight like how different these models are. You've got to have a good semantic vector space that accurately represents what you're trying to find in the documents. Or build your own, and we'll get there in a couple of slides. So let's look at a better one. So space choice matters. On this, I've loaded up the vector space for English. This English one, I think I have it linked online, but if I don't have it linked on our, our website, I can um, put in the link. You can download this from the LSA Fun website, and it's a representation of English as a whole. Okay, so it's the first couple thousand dimensions when we consider the um, Eng and Wikipedia of English and the, a couple of the English subtitle projects. So this hopefully will be a lot better. It's first hundred thousand dimensions, sorry. So here are semantic space and look how much better we're doing. So from sentence to sentence, this student's answer is fairly coherent. It's covering the same dimensions. The topic of the themes are the same. So on average, their global score was about 80. And that's pretty good. And so if I wanted to use this as a scoring algorithm, I and like math that onto to, um, real scores that you might get in a class, what I would do is calculate this for all of my students and then I curve to them. <laughs> right? Because you can almost never get it to be one here, even if it's a great answer. So that's okay. I know the student now is at least writing in somewhat coherent English. Can I do better? Of course I could do better. So I would make my own space. Now if you look at the lecture notes um, in this section, these don't run. These uh, chunks are turned off. So be sure if you're like cutting and pasting, don't use a chunk that is off because then it won't run in your, in your um, assignment. Um, because I can't share the textbook with you because it's a textbook. So what I did was I took the PDF of the textbook and built a semantic space out of the textbook. So maybe instead of comparing their answers to English, what I can actually do is compare their answers to the text that we're using. It would be even better if I did the specific chapter, but this is just a demonstration. So I did the um, um, whole book. When I actually scored these, I had a written answer that I thought was perfect. So I had taken students' answers that I thought were like, this would get 100, and made those my gold standard answer. Um, but let's show you how to make a semantic space given some documents. So first thing you have to do is use the TM library. The TM library is very popular. It is awesome. And what that allows you to do, do is build a corpus object. Okay, so corpus objects are just a special type of list, really, honestly, um, that have each document embedded. And I have my data as one giant column in a data frame. And so when you have the, the imported text documents as like one, like one text document per row, you can use this function vector source. But don't let me dissuade you from the fact that TM can handle a lot of different types of data. So what we've done before, too, is had like um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of research articles. And what we did was we um, uh, imported a bunch of PDFs. So there are other ways to build a corpus object in R, but this is one of the easier ones. To have everything as one document per row. And so we've got our corpus now. Um, since I can't, since this is now a corpus object, I can't use preprocess. I could have preprocessed it before I put it into the corpus, but I wanted to show you another way to preprocess, which is TM map, which is like the most beautiful thing ever. 
So um, what we're going to do here is use TM map to do a couple of, of function things. Um, since we're building a space, we want to take out punctuation. We want to remove stop words. So stop words are things like the NA of. Uh, TM has a large list of stop words because they tend to overrun a space because they're very, very frequent and they're in every document and they're not very useful at helping us distinguish between different things that are going on in documents. So this takes out things like pronouns and function words. All right, so what you do is TM map, you put in the name of the corpus that you're mapping, and then you give it a function. So the function here is to lower, easy to understand, remove punctuation, also easy to understand, remove words, and you have to tell what type of words you want to remove, so I'm going to remove English stop words. All right, so after I have now built my corpus and pre-processed it, I'm going to transform this into my term by document matrix. So you do this with a function called term document matrix, put it in your book corpus, and then we're just going to convert that back to a regular matrix so that we can do some stuff to it. So term document matrix is a, again a special type of object in R, and so converting it back to a matrix like, gives us a little bit more control over what happens next. So this is a raw count vector matrix, sometimes is what they're called, of, of each word and each document and their raw frequencies. The problem is sparsity. So sparsity is the fact that many words do not appear in every document. And um, so the, the vocabulary rows, it's gonna have a lot of zeros because that word only occurred in document 10 and so the rest of the row is all zero. And the fact that the cell sizes, unless you have many, many, many documents, tend to be small. So we have a sparse matrix, many zeros, many small counts. <clears throat> so what do I do about a sparse matrix? Well, every vector space model treats this problem a little bit differently. And in LSAs, the, the basic idea that they suggest, now this is not the only way to do this, um, is to multiply the uh, log term frequency by the inverse document frequency. That is very similar to what's called a TF-IDF transform, term frequency by inverse document frequency. That's not quite the math for TF-IDF. This is a slightly different formula, um, but that's basically the idea of it. It's a log of the frequencies times the inverse document frequency. What does that do? Well, you know, you go from what is essentially a Poisson matrix, right, where you have lots and lots of very small numbers and a long tail to a sort of shifted, not quite so skewy matrix. Okay? And so we have, um, we're kind of bringing all of those um, um, frequencies down so that the matrix is not quite as sparse. And there are lots of ways to control for matrix sparsity. This is just the most popular one for LSA. And I feel like the choice just kind of depends on like where you learned this, <laughs> honestly. Um, but if you Google like LSA, this is the common way to do it. So we're building weights for this. Now we're gonna take that weight matrix and apply the actual singular vector decomposition. And so that's this LSA function. Okay, so run that SVD and then convert back into our basically our words by dimensions matrix. So when we come back and we take it from the LSA to the text matrix, um, what we end up with is words by dimensions. Now you can only have as many dimensions as you have documents. Um, you can go less, but you can't go more. Okay, so if I have 2,000 documents, I can only have up to 2,000 dimensions. But the numbers here represent the weight to the dimension and not the uh, count or the um, converted uh, book weights. Okay, so this is now the dimensional weight based on that singular value decomposition. So if you run, look at the matrices for um, 
the next model, what we'll see is that we have terms by 42, and I have 42 student answers. So it's tempting to think that that's documents, but it's actually dimensions. But just like uh, if you look at factor analysis with eigenvalues, remember you can only get as many eigenvalues as you have items. Same, same issue here. All right. So I loaded up my book, L, book LSA, and I do think that file is included online. And I ran it again. Okay, so now we've run it three times. Alice in Wonderland, English, and the book. And notice that the student's answer now is still fairly coherent from sentence to sentence, but is not as high as English. So I know they're not writing about Alice in Wonderland. Great. <laughs> Good job. I know that they're writing in English, coherent English. Okay, awesome. And they're pretty good at capturing the book. The further these two scores get apart, English to um, the book, the less that they are, the, the more they're just writing filler, right, than they are writing about the topic at hand. Now, these scores will definitely be lower because this is the entire book. And um, obviously, books are written in a very formal, boring, scientific way, and the students' answers tend to be a bit more normal speech. Right? They're not meant to write these very formal texts. So I would take this kind of score and then curve it. Or whatever algorithm, or however you wanted to take this and make it their score. So this is a way we can use LSA to score texts, um, which is kind of a little bit different from classification. You could use this as a classification scenario, of like if, this, if it's this high of a score, it goes into this category. Um, but in my case, I, I liked having it as continuous measure. All right. Now on the same matrix, I can now start to explore the matrix. And one way to do that is the plot neighbors function. Now this is handy. I can, um, this, on this one I'm doing this by word because I want to know, like, according to the book, what words are the closest to attention? So I said, well, here's the, the topic or the theme that the text, the answers were supposed to be about. And give me the 10 most popular neighbors okay, based on my book. Plot that using multidimensional scaling. You can also use P, uh, principal components. This takes it from this wide dimensional space and plots it into two dimensions, basically. You can go more, but I promise you two is about as much as one can handle. And then I think I have the picture just here. So here's attention, and according to the book, pay attention, very popular together, labeling of attention, that makes sense given the book, Hall and Woodward, a very popular experiment that it spends some time talking about, the, the thing underneath here is um, a number, here are the ones, um, the year of that experiment, joint attention, so focusing on something, two things at once, and settings. So we'll talk about this problem between setting and settings in a little bit. So this is what the book thinks attention is about. Um, I could also calculate words that are similar to attention. And so choose target is this really nice function of like, can I find things that are a little bit similar, a lot a bit similar, things that appear in the same context? And so you pick the concept and in information here and pick a upper and lower cosine. Okay. So this will be a middle of the road. Like these are words that appear in similar types of areas in the textbook. Okay. And so it picked a random set of 10 of them. And so 1983 comes up and that seems a little odd, except that it's probably based on the experiments that are talked about in the same documents as the words that documents that include information. A document in this case is paragraphs from the textbook. And so what I can kind of see are these are words that appear with this information. And they're clearly not words that mean the same thing as information because I've picked a middle of the road cosine. So these are words that appear in the same types of things that information appears in. And that distinction is subtle but important. That similarity here can be described as appears in the same types of places, okay, in the same types of documents with the same themes, versus is a synonym 
meaning it means exactly the same thing. Um, I think cosine would need to be much higher to be a synonym. All right. So I'm going to do that whole thing again, but this time on the students' documents. So I'm going to create a corpus of their actual answers and see if I can see the differences between the textbook and their answers. And so I just did the whole thing all in one slide here. So I loaded um, uh, the students' answers into this uh, vector source. I lowercase them. I removed punctuation this time because I'm interested in building the space. I removed stop words. And I didn't run this line, but you should consider thinking about it. It's called stem document. Stemming is the process of removing the affixes of a word. So um, I said it here, we'll talk about excuse me, setting versus settings, that's the same word. Right? And so we probably need to combine those into one unit instead of two. And the way, a simple way to do that is called stemming. Okay? And then in a stem, we would just lop off the ing, take it off. Here are the ing s here. And so we'd have set. So that would get combined with the word set as well. Um, but at least it would smush those into one row instead of multiple rows. But, um, and so labeling would become label, that kind of thing. The problem with stemming is that it's kind of a hack. Okay, so depending on the type of stemmer that you pick, it will treat anything with an ing as, as a gerund or present participle tense and cut it off. So morning, which is not a verb, will become more than matter. So it doesn't take into account the context of words. Now, some of them are pre-programmed to deal with, like morning is one of the exception words. But there are a lot of things in this data set that it would just kind of create. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Create, uh, make them the same, and then maybe not. A better choice would be limitization which is where we find the word in its context and change it back into its root word. But that is a computationally intense process. <laughs> and so, um, and it's, it requires you set up kind of a lot of work. And so most people just either try it without stemming and then try it again with stemming and see if they get a different answer. Okay. So that's how you would stem if you were interested in doing that. All right, so that's the pre-processing step. Here's the corpus step where I took it, the term document matrix, applied my sparsity kind of correction, ran the singular vector decomposition, singular value decomposition. I really am attached to the word vector tonight. Um, and then converted that back into a dimensional space I can use. If you wanted to save it, you could save it as an RDA file. because we've converted it back into text matrix. So same thing now, what does attention look like for the students' answers? Okay, so that's the same code and I have, oh, I thought I had the picture on another slide, but I guess not, so let's just scroll. Notice here that the attention, the overlap between the previous one and the current one are totally different. And this makes me happy because this is what I ask students to do. They're describing what attention is, focusing right, on some information over other information. I ask them to explain to me what is change blindness. So they're using change blindness to describe attention. So change blindness is like candid camera. It's when something changes in your visual field and you don't notice. So you're not paying enough attention. Right? So change blindness is a lot of fun. It's used, you know, it's why they don't fix things in movies, because most people don't notice. Um, there's a really famous study called The Invisible Gorilla that you'll see pop up here in a minute. Um, oh, sorry, you'll see that next week, the gorilla thing. Endogenous was another word I was asking them to explain as controlled attention versus exogenous, which is kind of um, involuntary stuff. So this looks a lot like well, the things I asked them to do. So this is really encouraging to me because these are the words that I asked them to describe. And so that's maybe why their answers don't match the textbook perfectly, is because I've asked them to combine several chapters into one. 
So what else is there? Well, I can now start to explore a bunch of concepts at once. So I would pick a set of words and then I can plot those specific words. So I don't have to tell it, just give me every neighbor of attention. Give me these four words and how do these four words overlap? So this would be really useful if you had some keywords and you were digging through documents and you were trying to see if these keywords were similar enough to each other or trying to see, you can almost do sentiment this way too. Kind of as a hack, but you could like download a bunch of tweets, grab the thing you're interested in the sentiment. So let's say a person's name or a product name, and then just look for like, how close is it to good and how close is it to bad as our words. Just build a space that way. Um, we could also calculate the cosine value, so how much do they uh, appear in the same documents. So I've picked a, a couple of words here that I think um, represent some students' answers. Now you do have to pick words that are in the space. So this will not run if you pick a word that has never occurred in your documents. So we've got, what else can you do? <sighs> Object. So paying attention to objects, insignificant, because it's just kind of a fun word, um, attention and endogenous. And here I've told it to just plot me that list. Okay, so it's not plot neighbors anymore, it's plot word list. But, and then it gives you the codes down here. So you could take this output and use ggplot if you want a prettier plot, but this is the basic functionality. And so according to this, what I see is that these clearly separate into two buckets, if you will. So insignificant and object are kind of more related and attention and endogenous are more related. Uh, okay, this picture. You can also calculate the cosines between them. Now that will represent the same kind of relationships. So insignificant and object have a very high relationship. And, you know, they're kind of related. Um, but then attention and endogenous also have a very high relationship. So it kind of recreates that picture with numbers for you. All right, so that's how you do that in R. LSA Fun as a package has more options that you can use, and the LSA package itself also has some more stuff that you can do. But I think in general, their utility in an analytics perspective is coherence, calculating those values for coherence of a document compared to a space, um, finding visually, finding things that are related to each other. This plot word list function is really handy. Um, and maybe finding synonyms, finding words that are very similar given your documents. Okay. So let's say you want to find, um, you have a list of products, like that product review stuff, and you want to know how, what words are the most related to good? So what are the words people are using for sentiment? Now let's look at how we do this in Python, because this is kind of a preview of Gensum. We haven't really used Gensum yet, and it is like one of my new favorite packages in the world, even though I'm an R person. I love Gensum. It's such a great Python package. So first step, uh, open up some NLTK, because we're going to use NLTK to help us clean up the data. There's even more that you can do to clean up the data, but we'll start with something simple. For Gensum, we're going to import the corpora function. This helps us build that corpus object. The LSI model function, that's the LSA. Coherence model, so we could actually use coherence to think about how many dimensions something should be. This is not as easy in R. And uh, matplotlib to make some graphs. All right, so I'm going to move my answers from R into Python, and they need to be in a list. So instead of having a vector, we just have a list of every student's answer. Now, I will tell you there are a lot of ways to do this. Um, Python people like loops, so we can use loops, but there are ways in pandas. Pandas is the tidy tibble of Python, I guess. There are ways in pandas to use the apply function, and I'll show you an example of that in one of the next lectures. Let's say we just want to process this as in list using a loop. So I'm going to build myself a new empty list to save my data in. I'm going to loop over my exam answers because I don't really have that many. 
And then this will be the Python code that sort of represents what TM is doing. Uh, lowercase e chancer, tokenize e chancer, so break it into individual words. So I can do this. Give me back that word for every word in my answer, as long as it's not in stop words. So I do think once you get the hang of Python loops, they're a little bit more readable. Right. So I want words for every word in answer if the words are not in my stop words list. In this case, I did stem. Okay, so give me the stem for every word in my answer. And then I stuck it back in to my new list. And so you can see what it did here, the stemming. Okay, this is the Porter stemmer, which is sometimes called the Snowball stemmer, and that's actually TM's default. So if we did do stemming with TM, this is what we would get. Okay, and you know, this just like kind of cuts off the end of most of these words. Um, the other thing to notice here is that generally these functions in Python require a tokenized list. Okay, and R didn't. It, did, it handled all of that for us. So I think the hardest thing sometimes when working with these different packages is just figuring out what input type it wants. And so in Python, generally this is a tokenized list. Not always, but generally. Um, in R, it tends to be more of um, a one long character string. Uh, broken up by document. You have to keep the document part separate. So this is um, a list of token tokens. So I have document one printed out here, but then it also has document two, three, four. So it's still a vector. All right. Now to create our term by document matrix, what we use is the corpora function in Jensen. We do dot dictionary to get the vocabulary list. And all this does is it finds all the unique tokens. Okay. And then we take that dictionary that we just saved and do doc to bow. Okay. Bow here stands for bag of words. So that creates this nice term by document matrix of um, the vocabulary from step one by the documents and adds all the counts. Now I've called this a doc term matrix here because um, Jensen actually takes it the other way. It has documents by, by terms. It practically does not matter. It's the same matrix. They're just kind of flip-flopped or transposed is the word I'm looking for. Now this is crazy and I took it from the textbook. <laughs> but what's happening is we can calculate coherence. So I showed you coherence before. Let me show you coherence again. And what um, for coherence here, what we do is actually calculate the coherence on the entire semantic space and use coherence not now as a measure of relatedness sentence to sentence, but as sort of a global understanding of like how many themes are there. Right. Um, so what we use this in the same way as silhouette distance okay, or eigenvalues. And so what this particular function does is it calculates the coherence given the number of dimensions. Okay. And you tend to see reducing um, returns for larger numbers of dimensions depending on how many documents you have. So if I have 100,000 documents, there are going to be a lot of dimensions there. Okay. I have 42 documents and they're all supposed to be about the same thing, so there's probably not a lot of dimensions there. And so what we've done is built this function that takes the dictionary. Okay, that's the dictionary that we just built. It takes our term document matrix, okay, the original cleaned up text, how many dimensions to start, how many dimensions to stop, and how many to increase by. So the defaults here are start with two dimensions and work your way up to 100. Okay, that, those two numbers should really be biased by the amount of documents that you have. So more documents tends to be more dimensions. Because there's just more themes possible. Okay, so the English one we loaded earlier was 100,000 dimensions. It was a lot. And it's going to save your coherence value. So for each number of talk, uh, topics, blah, 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 for each number of dimensions to run, it builds the LSI model. 
and calculates coherence. Okay. Now I have this calculating coherence using UMass. UMass is not the most popular one. It's, um, this tool, what is the most popular one? Hmm. Oh, just forgotten. Hmm. Coherence. I would say the most common ones, I've got UMass here. Where is it? Um, CV maybe is one of the most popular ones. That's this matter. CUCI. Um, UMass, however, does not crash nearly as often as some of the other ones. So we were having some problems with Windows machines um, crashing, essentially. So uh, UMass is one that tends to run pretty well. That there are different ones. And so to calculate, you put in the name of the model, the model we just built based on the number of dimensions that it's currently processing, the corpus, the text, the dictionary, and then you tell it what type of coherence and save all that and run it. This here just makes this a pretty graph. Okay. So what we do, the graph calls this function. So it says, you know what? I'm going to make a graph and run this as many times as it needs to run to make that graph. So what you do is you run the graph, you put in your dictionary, your document term matrix, which is what I've called them already, your cleaned up text, which we call process text, the number of dimensions to start, the number of dimensions to stop, and how many steps. So this is from 2 to 12, increasing by 1, so 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Now, remember, you can only have as many dimensions as you have documents. So I can only go up to like 40 or so. And then the highest value wins, which in our case appears to be 2. But there's kind of something going on here between 4 and 5. Okay, I think 2 is probably too small, so maybe 5? Right? So this is a lot of, of interpretation based on your goals. So two is definitely too small in the number of dimensions. So I might try four or five. But you can see the diminishing value the more I got here. So it's either kind of four or five or seven and eight. Or three. You can go either way. So I picked four because that kind of made sense given what I know the documents are about. If you don't know what the documents are about, I would lean more heavily on the numbers, the coherence numbers. So you want to give me 10 words here. And now I will say this is where the the, the, the LSA fund package really is very handy because it creates these multidimensional uh, scaled pretty pictures and it has these cosine functions. And if you wanted to do that with Gensum, there are some ways I'm going to show you um, next week. But in general, uh, that requires you to write them like kind of ggplot, matplotlib code yourself. So while I love the Jensen package, there are better packages in R that handle the kind of pretty function pictures. But to create a model, because then you can use the outputs from these models to put into a machine learning algorithm or um, calculate other values on. If you're just wanting to work in Python, you put in the document term matrix, the number of topics, which I think is an unfortunate label because um, this is not a topics model, but it's the number of themes. So I'm going to go four. ID to word is your dictionary because the dictionary is like the list of the vocabulary. Once that runs, you can start to print out like what are the most the strongest related words to each dimension. It's called get topics. And so what we see is the strongest words here. So it creates a, basically a regression equation for each dimension. So for the first dimension, the very first strongest thing is a period. So I probably should have removed punctuation, but then we've got attention um, and then a comma. But attention, change, information, process, all right, cue, endogenous. 
So I could start to grab these values and that's how I would make uh, sort of a weighted plot or would know which ones are the most popular. And then it keeps going. So the, um, the where did the second one start? I missed it. Here it is. So here's the second dimension. Okay, and we've got information, but it's negative. Attention, bike. This is, um, we're going to talk more about why the word bike would appear here. <laughs> Next week, it's a study called the Invisible Gorilla Process, Target, Pay Attention. So you see the words are very similar. So we're getting a same, the same answer. It's just that the LSA Fun package like makes this into a nice plot for you. Okay. All right, so all that together is a LSA model. What would I use an LSA model for? Well, I have used a calculate coherence. This I've done to score documents. How much do these documents relate to other documents? I've used it, um, one more here, to find those kind of related themes in the space. So I'm like, okay, I want to know what's related to X and found the most commonly related words in those spaces. Um, but Caveat here, the, the space itself heavily influences the way that these turn out, as we saw. Okay. I've used it to calculate cosine values for semantic similarity purposes. This is one of the most popular things that people like me do with this stuff. And that kind of relatedness measure can help us predict other variables. And really the goal of these models is exploration. So they allow me to create variables that I can then use in linear regression or logistic regression or factor analysis. Um, but they themselves, like the model itself, is just a, a tool to get to those other numbers. And also really an exploration. So it's more of a data mining technique uh, because we're cre essentially creating what we think is a multidimensional space of that text. So these are really cool if you build them on like textbooks and that's kind of what I'm not textbooks on, on um, books in general. Uh, so that's what the assignment is, is to pick a couple of books that are available in Project Gutenberg and um, essentially build the model. And it suggests that you use um, different books to see if you can pull back out that there are differences between the books. And so what I suggest you do to kind of get at that question is pick words that you pick books that are pretty different or pretty much the same either way and pick words that would occur in those books. So let's say if I use 10,000 leagues under the sea and I could pick water, okay, and make sure that the other words that show up are words that I would expect to find in 10,000 leagues under the sea. But if I compare that to Emma, which is a Jane Austen novel, I shouldn't see love in there. Okay? And so I can kind of see like they, there are different spaces. There are different pieces of the space, different dimensions, because those words don't appear in the same documents. Okay. Um, and so I can use that to predict other stuff, and we'll get next week into topics modeling, which allows us to do this even better um, and actually create, um, you know, kind of, we can maybe recreate those chapters or those differences between the books by looking at the most popular most strongly related words to each dimension.